Good morning, everybody. We're just so happy to have everyone here today on this lovely Sunday morning. Um, and we're very honored to have the um, Frank Plumleys here with us today. And Bob's going to be giving us our message. We're grateful for that. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to come and freely worship you in this beautiful building. We come to praise you and thank you for our bountiful blessings. Thank you for the families and all those who come together to make this service possible. May we each one leave this building uplifted and renewed in spirit. Amen. So we need to keep her in our prayers this week. Yeah. And um, we were very fortunate this past week to get to spend time with Rose Powell. Um, we have a Monday morning group that meet together and we met over at her house. And that was wonderful. And then Barb and I took her to Great Falls for a Barb was the driver. So I just went along for the company. Um, and she really, she really did well. And um, we had a really wonderful time. Um, as far as things coming up, on Wednesday, the window committee is going to meet at five to discuss options that were presented to us from the body studios. Is that what you were gonna talk about? Okay, and when I get down here, Barb has another one too though. Um, on October 20th, we're going to have our board meeting that normally would be on the 18th. Um, and we are gonna have a special guest, um, Bill Roby. Uh, who uh, in the early 2000s was our um, interim minister. He is going to come as the regional inter, uh, in, interim minister, and he's going to give us some leadership and just help us to decide where we're going to go. And everybody's welcome to come. So that would be six o'clock on October 20th. It's Thursday instead of Tuesday. Um, okay, Barb. Okay. 
this is such a big announcement, I had to write it down. So um, most of you know that the board has been in discussion the last couple months and prayer about our future here at FCC. And we've all recognized that doing things the way we've always done them is probably not an option for us at this point. And we, like a lot, most, I think, other churches are in the midst of some big changes. So the board has had some heartfelt discussion and decided that we all need to be together in that discussion. And most of you were here, um, I see Dave back there, it's been a month or so ago that we had a discussion during worship. And we, um, we just dipped our toes in a little bit, so to speak. And we really need more time to share our faith our doubts, our fears, and our hopes. So next Sunday, we, we have another option. We have the opportunity to hear from someone that may be able to lead us um, deeper into these conversations. Her name is um, Reverend Se Seisha Vick. She's a retired minister that's going to join us next Sunday virtually for worship. She will be in introducing herself and an in-depth faith study. Um, the board met with Stacia at the last board meeting and agreed that we need to have the whole church meet her and consider the option. So next Sunday, she'll be our, our guest here. So I hope everybody can come next Sunday. Yes, virtual guest. Yes. And um, also worship committee is going to meet tomorrow afternoon at five. So if you're interested in worship committee, you can come join us. We meet here. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Barb. Um, join us in singing with Terry. <laughs> Thank you 
so much. We're so glad to have Terry's sister. I'm sorry for you. Sorry. Charlene, we're very grateful to have you with us today. Um, we're going to skip the children's sermon today. So, um, because there's no children. So, we will go right to the scripture. And it's from my favorite book of the Bible. Verses in Philippians. Well, this is from Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. Okay. Thank you. A prim and proper Christian woman got a job at uh, on Main Street, a shop. And on the first day or two that she got the job, she noticed a man sitting across the street in front of the hardware store. And periodically, someone would come by and give him a little money, and they'd have a, just a wonderful little chat. And he seemed so appreciative that she thought, well, isn't that nice? So she thought, you know, what I ought to do is be benevolent as well. So she took an envelope, put $2 in it, and wrote Godspeed on it. Well, the next day, the gentleman came in, and he said, here's your $56. Godspeed at odds of 20 to 1 came in first. I kind of that way with the word Jesus. You have to stop and find out if they're swearing or if they're really thanking God. God's speed came in first. Well, Jesus Christ comes in first, too. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look back 2,000 years, uh, outside of ancient Rome, Two strangers meet walking along a dusty road. They are involved in conversation, just casual conversation, but as, as the time rolls on and they cover a mile or two, they suddenly are starting to sense a kinship. And finally they sit down to rest, and one of them takes the walking stick, his walking stick, and Drives, draws a little circle, a half circle. The other one glances around, takes his stick and draws a circle, creating the image of a fish. One of them says, Jesus is Lord. The other one says, Jesus is Lord indeed. The fish, 2,000 years ago, was a symbol of the faith. And it was a way without having to verbalize uh, that the person is part of the faith. Now, some of you are probably familiar with this fish story. And this is a fish story, but it's, it's a good fish story. Uh, the Greek word for fish is spelled I-X-T-H-T-H. Uh, well, ichthus, 
is the word. I, rather than spell it, I probably should pronounce it, ichthus. And the I stands for Jesus, because it's not a J, it's an I as it's written. Uh, Yesu. And the uh, CH for us is an X. Christ. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Ichthus. So uh, that became a symbol in the ancient times. And it had to be because if you were to be outwardly a Christian, you could be, uh, well, killed. You could be executed for professing faith in Christ. So uh, 2,000 years pass, and in the world today, uh, there are places where you might still be persecuted for being a Christian. In America, we have the privilege of not being in that position, but uh, we can confess that Jesus is Lord. Now, uh, there's a point I'm reading, leading to here in which uh, we find that the words Jesus is Lord is believed by many, if not most, to be the most ancient of creeds, the most ancient of creeds. If we go to Romans, for instance, Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, there's those three words, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There are those who uh, believe that those three words were the key to being accepted in the church in the ancient times. And when we go on over to 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 starts out with these words. Now encouraging, now concerning spiritual growth gifts, brothers and sisters, do not, <clears throat> let me start over here. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray by idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. As I read this, the people who put together the scripture have put in quotes this, those three words, Jesus is Lord, uh, that it might stand out to the reader, Jesus is Lord. <clears throat> and then uh, in today's scripture, we heard read at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God there's a slight twist there the insertion of the word Christ Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God every knee shall bow it's it's no wonder that this is a favorite uh, passage because of the depth of what it says about Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> in another variation in 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 5, for we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Christ Jesus. Now, there's a slight variation there. Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what we proclaim. And we do. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. It's a twist on that very ancient creed. Colossians 2 6. As you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live by him. See, as you have received. In the ancient time, that seems to be 
the creed of the church that comes through over and over. And it's a simple, simple one. In fact, from time to time in my life, <clears throat> I've used those words simply as a mantra. Christians don't normally talk of mantras, but as you think about it, to be able to say the words over and over, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple, beautiful way of being able to repeat something that has depth and meaning. And uh, you can find various authors who uh, lift this up in their writings. Having a good character reference doesn't necessarily mean that one is a Christian, but I like to think that being a Christian means that one does have a good character reference. We Christians are a witness not only by what we say, but our actions and our words. While I was pastoring in Great Falls in the 1990s, I read that Citibank instituted an unusual loan program called Character Loans. I don't know if it lasted long, but <clears throat> it was written up and promoted. These particular loans were not granted on the basis of good credit or an outstanding business plan. Instead, they were small loans made on the basis of the loan applicant's character. If a loan officer assessed the applicant as being of good character and therefore more likely to pay back the loan, then they would be granted a uh, loan out of and uh, out of the 10 million lent through character loans, only 30,000 had been paid back. And that was reported in Harper Business in 1997. I got to thinking about that and so often how we uh, look to character. That's what the Christian is, is looking to character. Uh, when Jesus is Lord, that's a meaning in our lives. It's, it's our character and, and so forth. <clears throat> Jesus is Lord. A woman tells of losing her mother whom she called her dearest friend to cancer. Always supportive, her mother clapped loudest at the woman's school plays when she was growing up laughed longest at funny situations, listened intently to her as a teenager with her struggles, comforted her in her father's death, encouraged her in college, and told her of prayers offered on her behalf. When her mother's illness was diagnosed, the woman's sister, who had a new baby, said, well, it kind of falls to you. Her brother recently married. Uh, so it fell on her, the 27-year-old middle child without entanglements to take care of her mother. She counted it an honor, even though it was a difficult one. Now she sat at her mother's funeral the hurt was so intense, she found it hard to breathe. What now, Jesus? I call you Lord, what now? She asked almost out loud, it seemed, alone sitting there. Her brother and her sister and their families were there as well. But for her, it seemed there was no one. Her place had been with her mother for these past few years, preparing her meals, helping her walk, taking her to the doctor, seeing to her medications, reading the Bible together with her. Now her mother was gone and here she was. Then she heard a door open, right, as the funeral was in progress and it slammed shut. Quick footsteps hurried along the carpeted floor. An exasperated young man looked around briefly and then sat down next to her. He folded his hands and placed them on his lap. His eyes were brimming with tears. He began to sniffle. I'm late, he said. 
I feel so bad. After several minutes, he leaned over and asked, why do they keep calling her Mary? Her name is Margaret. Oh, because that was her name, Margaret, never Mary. No one called her Mary, she said. She wondered why this person couldn't have simply sat there quietly or even why he sat next to her, interrupting her grieving and her tears. Who is this stranger anyway? He spoke again. No, no, that's not correct. Uh, her name is Mary, Mary Peters. That isn't who she is. Well, isn't this the Lutheran Church? Uh, no, the Lutheran Church is down the street. I believe you're at the wrong funeral, sir. The psalmist, the occasion mixed with her realization that the man's mistake was so intense she burst out laughing and then tried to cover her up so it seemed like a sob but yes she had burst out with laughter somehow she still got sharp looks from those mourners around her as she fidgeted in her seat and the situation became hilarious to her. Why? She began to think that her mother would have gotten a great deal of laughter out of this moment. And it suddenly changed her mood and she felt uplifted. She knew that her mother was getting the last laugh. After the final amen, they walked out the door together and confirmed to everyone that everyone confirmed that everyone had gone from the Lutheran church down the street. He said his name was Rick. Since he had missed his aunt's funeral, could she go out to coffee with him? Well, that afternoon was 22 years ago and the next year they were married in the country church where he was assistant pastor. This time they both arrived at the same church at the same time. The woman writes, in my time of sorrow, gave, God gave me laughter. In place of loneliness, God gave me love. Indeed, Jesus is Lord. And Jesus heard me as I cried out, Lord, where are you? Amen. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> that was a wonderful story. Now it's time for the prayer of the people. Does anybody have any prayer requests today? First of all, Morris, and she's a long, long time friend of ours. She had stroke about nine days ago, and she's still in the hospital. So she's in a coma. Uh, I have a joy. Yay! I'm also going to go up. I am so happy that the weather has been so nice and working on a shop. What I'm really grateful for is the friends today that I can count on. And I view that as a church here too. Friends I can count on. Thank you. Just prayers for the whole world and the country. Yeah, it's just a very time pass and for our church. Also, it's we just face many challenges. But it's a beautiful time and we want to go if we let ourselves to be positive. Anybody else? Thank you. 
Dear Lord, we lift up our hearts to you. We lift up our prayers to you, Lord. We lay down our sorrows, our burdens, and our pain at your feet. But may we in return raise our praise to you for the joys and the miracles given to us every day. We thank you for this church and ask you for your guidance as we face the future. Our world is in such turmoil and our words feel weak. So we turn to the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we forgive those. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because my daughter lives in Florida, I was particularly fascinated by the powerful Hurricane Ian. I was terrified as it unleashed its ferocity upon the lands, knowing that my daughter was in its sights. Afterward, when she was okay, I became obsessed at watching videos, particularly those of Fort Myers, as I had been there several times. These showed that mother nature at her most powerful. Humankind had no defense. The scripture today has even more power. 
all the power to save our very souls. Mother nature in all her theory cannot touch them. We come to the table to confirm that power and to honor it. Please affirm with me that all are welcome at Christ's table. As visiting minister, one always doesn't get all the clues and cues. So uh, I step forth in that respect. And as we gather at the table, we do remember that at the end of three years of public ministry, Jesus came to a special moment when he realized that the call was upon him. And that call was to give himself. So on the night of the Passover, and by the way, I might remind you that the Passover goes back a thousand years to the time when the Jewish people, well, I were called Israelites at that point, but the Israelite people were led out of slavery. The last of the plagues that would fall on Egypt was the plague of the death of a firstborn child. And if you did not have the blood of the lamb spread, uh, rubbed across the doorpost and the mantle of the, of the uh, door where you were living, your ch firstborn child would die. It's really a frightening story, but it has to do with blood, the blood of the lamb. So a thousand years, and by the way, the blood of the lamb spread on the doorpost meant the, that God's spirit would pass over that family, not hurting the firstborn. But the Passover would not take place of any family who did not believe in God and what Moses was calling the people to do. If they didn't follow Moses' instruction, then they were not passed over. So a thousand years later comes the Passover. And in that context is one thing, the blood. And as we get around the table on this day, we remember that night in which Jesus, in the midst of that Passover meal, we call the last uh, supper, Jesus took the bread and lifted it up and said, this is my body broken for you. They didn't realize the significance of it at that moment. Perhaps they were more tuned in when he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Not the old covenant, but a blood of a new covenant. My blood poured out for you. And that was in the context of that Passover that this took place, this meal. And so we gather, knowing that the next day Jesus is crucified, his body is broken, his blood is spilled, and we remember as we gather around. But this is for us. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, your plan to save us is difficult for us to comprehend. That kind of love is sacrificing your son. Help us to remember how you want us to be humble, selfless, and obedient, confessing Jesus Christ is Lord to your glory. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Please bow your heads in prayer as we pray for our offerings. Dear Father, as we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God. Amen.
I don't know if this wireless is working or not because I yeah, think I, on the there, on the well, I'll, there we go. I'm good. Uh, I brought up the Passover impromptu. I really wasn't expecting that as a part of my communion, but that's just how it came out. And I got to thinking as it was pointed out to me that I'm giving the benediction, I thought, oh, well, I haven't thought that far. And then it dawned on me that it's so appropriate that the Israelites came out of Egypt, went through the Red Sea and into Mount Sinai. And there we have these words. And so I put this benediction in context with communion and with the Passover, because here's how it reads in the sixth chapter of Numbers. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to uh, Aaron and his sons saying, thus you shall bless the Israelites. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You are free from slavery. Go in peace. Amen. 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 